and we are so excited to kick off our first information session for this year. My name is Mimi Amareji. I am the Director of uh, Recruitment, Outreach and Retention here at the UCSF School of Nursing. And with me this evening are our amazing faculty members and specialty coordinators that you will get to talk to as we go on in the session tonight. Um, okay, let's get started. Uh, if you have just joined us, if you are comfortable, please share in the chat what specialty you're interested in. This evening is about intentional connection. So we want to connect with you and so do our faculty members. So if you can type in the chat where you're from, what specialty you're interested in. I already have received a bunch of questions that um, as part of your registration process. So we know who you are. And if you've started an application, also let us know in the chat. We're so excited you're here this evening. Let's do introductions. So I'm not the only one here today hosting this session. This session would not be uh, complete without our program director, Dr. Waxman, as well as my supervisor, Dr. Zavala. So I'm gonna hand it over to them to do introductions so we can get started. Dr. Zavala. Thank you, Mimi. It's great to see everyone. Uh, it's great to see all my colleagues and all the prospective applicants. We're definitely looking forward uh, to sharing some information with you, but also hearing from you with regards to any questions that you might have. Uh, we will post uh, some emails that you could follow up with questions if we can't address them all. And you could definitely reach out to me directly if you, if you wish as well. So, uh, Dr. Waxman. Thank you, Dr. Zavala. Welcome, everyone. I'm just looking at the chat, and there's quite a wide variety uh, of interests, which is fantastic for our specialty coordinators tonight. And you'll hear all about each of the specialties in a moment. Um, I want to welcome all of you to our first information session of the year, as our applications are open now. Um, my name is KT Waxman. I'm the director of the program, which includes the post masters and the post bachelor's pathways. I will be talking a little bit about the program um, from a global perspective, the courses, what to expect, and then I'll turn it over to our um, associate dean, um, Mary Lynch, who will start the facilitation of the specialty areas. So I'll take the next slide, Mimi. We're gonna talk you through each pathway, I think I just said that, uh, the structure of the program, specialty, and then Mimi's gonna talk a little bit about the application requirements and the process, talk about the financial pieces. We'll then end and talk about, uh, open it up for questions and answers and close with next steps. Um, but at any time, if you have a question, you can always put it in the chat. And after we're finished uh, with this session, we'll address all of the questions in the chat. So here we go. So this pathway is new. We just launched it this summer. Uh, UCSF has, has sunsetted their master's program. We have moved to all doctoral education and started off with a BSN to DMP pathway in June of 24. We have approximately 60 students in the cohort right now with various specialties. And I wanna to talk to you about this degree. This degree is a practice focused academic degree which prepares experts in evidence-based practice, quality improvement and leadership. You'll hear us say quite a few times throughout the presentation that we look at evidence-based practice. That is woven throughout the entire program as is the QI and a leadership thread. It blends the clinical, the leadership, economic, and organizational skills in direct, whether you're touching patients, or indirect, whether you're leading teams um, to positively impact patient outcomes and staff outcomes. We prepare students for advanced nursing practice and leadership opportunities in a variety of settings. And the DNP is endorsed by professional organizations such as the CRNA, the nurse anesthetist, CNS, clinical nurse specialist, and nurse practitioner. At this time, those three organizations endorse the DMP. Next slide. So why come to UCSF and why join this pathway? 
We have designed this program to be very flexible. It's a hybrid format. We'll talk more about the hybrid format, but basically you will come in person for your clinicals. We do have other times that you come in person, but the rest of the program is online. So that's why we can get away with saying we're hybrid because we do both. Um, for each of the specialties, you will have to complete around 760 clinical hours. And in order to sit for your certification at the end of the program, and as a DMP student, you need to do 1,000 hours of clinical or practicum. And so the 760 is hands-on clinical hours, and the 240 practicum hours are saved for the end when we uh, reserve those for doing your project, which I'll talk about in a moment. So we prepare you for advanced practice in diverse healthcare settings with the support of our clinical Office of Clinical Placement. So we will be helping with those clinical placements. We will be assigning you. We have a holistic, admission, holistic admissions process. So we review uh, every aspect of your application and consider your academic achievements, your expectations, your experiences, and your dedication to healthcare. We have a very supportive cohort model uh, our students grow and succeed with a close-knit group of peers, fostering collaboration and professional connections. Our group of 60 that started this summer didn't know each other on the first day, and we had a three-day, what we call prelude, which is a mandatory course that starts in the summer. By the end of those three days, they were fast friends, exchanging numbers, and then each specialty has their own sub-cohort. So you have about you know, various uh, cohorts of people that you never knew before and that you'll grow very, grow very close with even after you graduate. We have tailored specialization tracks, choose from a wide range of specialties, which we'll go over tonight to match your career goals. And we're dedicated to improving healthcare. This program is focused on advancing healthcare outcomes with a commitment to training nurses who serve underserved communities and drive meaningful change in the field. So it's a three year program and this is year one. So we're talking about 12 quarters. We're on the quarter system here. The first quarter, as I said, we have this, uh, we call it prelude uh, or prologue. It's a three day uh, course in person in the summer. After that, everything is online for that summer quarter, quarter one. You'll have a course on concepts and theory, racism and genomics. And then quarter two, which is what we're in right now for the first cohort, is um, evidence-based practice, foundations courses, clinical prevention, and we have um, interprofessional practice for nurse leaders. These are all online. And the third quarter, we start with our skills lab, health assessment in the skills lab. And you're all practicing nurses, but you have to reframe your um, skills lab at this point because you're going to be trained as, as an advanced practice nurse. And this is when we have the three Ps, pathophys and farm. Quarter four, we jump into clinical. We still have some foundational courses, health outcomes, quality improvement. There's some specialty content, didactic, and then we move into our clinical courses. So that's year one. Year two and three, coming up here, we integrate those foundational courses for the DNP with specialty content. Our specialty content application is based on professionalism and certification. So all of the things that you'll do in your clinical will prepare you to sit for that certification at the end of the program. Direct specialty practice clinical application is about a thousand hours. 240 is dedicated uh, to the practicum, which is focused on leadership. We believe that the, the nurses that we graduate at the end of this program, although you're an advanced practice registered nurse, you're also a nurse leader. So whether you're practicing in the clinic or in the hospital, in the acute care setting, anywhere along the continuum, you're, you as a doctorally prepared nurse have the skills to lead others and uh, various patient populations. Next slide. So I mentioned the project early on. This is a QR code that will take you to, I believe, a link to some of our previous projects. So you can see the names of those projects. 
the DNP translates research into practice. So if any of you here on, on the webinar tonight really want to focus on research, we will talk to you after this program and help you navigate your way into our PhD program. You're not going to be doing research in this program. We will look at research, we will analyze, we will synthesize, we will determine what the best evidence is to move our idea as our project into practice. So we focus on the scholarly translation of research or evidence into real world settings. We look at practice and quality improvement. Think about areas that you have always said, why are we doing this? Why aren't we doing this? We drive enhancements in healthcare practice and patient outcomes through quality improvement initiatives. Most of our projects are quality improvement. They could be performance improvement. It could be a compliance issue that we need to utilize a DMP student to bring this particular organization up to compliance. Um, so there's various types of projects, but basically they're all looking at quality and improving the quality of the environment in which you're working. We have a feasible timeline, which ensures that the project is scalable and can be completed within four quarters. So I talked about those that year one and two, and then we start moving into some project series courses while you're thinking about what your project will be. And as I said, this QR code has a list of some of the titles of the uh, projects that we've done in the past. Next slide. So we have um, BSN to DMP pathway specialties are here on the board. And there's public health, health policy and public health, CNS, adult GERO CNS, and our nurse practitioners listed here. I won't read them all, but they're up on, on the screen right now. Now we're going to get into the detail of the specialty coordinator, uh, specialties. Next slide. First, first I want to, well, Mimi, I thought you had a slide here, but I guess I was wrong. We can segue into um, adult GERO. And I would think uh, Dr. Lynch is on the phone. Mary Lynch, do you want to unmute and say hello? Sorry, I was one of those people who was <laughs> a little bit challenged with getting online. Hi, my name is Mary Lynch. I'm the Associate Dean for um, our education programs. I am thrilled for all of you to be here, both our faculty who are going to talk about our programs and more important, for potential future students. So listen, ask questions, complete your application. Go Thanks, Dr. It. Lynch. And I'm going to, um, I think I'm going to turn it over to Astrid. Hi, yeah. yes, my name is Astrid Block, and I'm the current specialty coordinator for the adult gerontology clinical nurse specialist uh, track. And if you um, are passionate about improving nursing practice, enjoy teaching patients, families, and nurses, and have experience in a particular patient population that you'd like to utilize at an advanced practice uh, nurse level, then the clinical nurse specialist might be the right um, track for you to consider. Uh, clinical nurse specialists generally practice in three areas, direct patient care, uh, nurse and staff support, and systems change. And so you can see here that um, there's a number of skills, advanced clinical care, patient outcome improvement, and leadership, and a wide variety of settings. Um, we just have one track for adult gerontology clinical nurse specialists, and then uh, students often specialize based on where they do their clinical rotations, whether they're focused on oncology, for example, or critical care, or uh, emergency care, or geriatrics, um, that happens through your clinical hours. So I welcome any questions, and you can see my, my contact info there. Thank you, Astrid. Yep. And now I'm turning it over to Jim. Dr. Wayland. Scott. <laughs> yeah, hi, this is Scott Wayland. Uh, uh, I noticed in, in the introduction when, when you're at, some of the, the applicants were asked to put in their 
what, what programs they were interested in. There were some people that said the AG CNS, which Astrid just talked about, and I'm going to introduce uh, the AG ACNP or acute care nurse practitioner here in a second. I did notice one person that said critical care. So I hope that uh, these two things will help you clarify what it is you're thinking about studying, because in terms of critical care, you could be doing that as a clinical nurse specialist, or you could do that as, as a nurse practitioner. So uh, hopefully that, you know, our, our talk will help to, to, to clarify. The, the a, ACNP or AGACNP program is, is adult and gerontologic focused and acute care. So that means you're working in a high acuity setting, which is typically a, a hospital environment, but there, there are, are some, you know, AC, AGACMPs that work in, in other areas. You know, if you provide care in a high pressure setting, typically could be an intensive care unit, but a hospital setting, emergency department. You work collabor collaboratively and, and, as, and really as a coordinator of an interdisciplinary team and in, in creating and carrying out care plans, which you know, some of the things that you saw that the, AC, the AGCNS does, you're going to do as well, uh, but you'll be responsible for, for managing care and ordering tests and interpreting tests and, and you know, and dealing, and dealing with patients and their families. So hot, the setting is the, the hospital, could be a specialty clinic, um, and who's best for this, you know, if you want to advance your level of practice and you're in the hospital setting, this, this is the place. And, and, and for me, I, I would just say that it, it, took a, it took me a while to get to my graduate education because I've been around, uh, around a bit. You can probably tell by the white, uh, white mustache and hair. Uh, and, and really the ACNP or AGACNP has really only been around since the 90s. So, uh, you know, it's a relatively new specialty and it's a, it's a specialty that, that you, you see really growing throughout the healthcare uh, system in order to, you know, to have enough providers to, to effectively manage, you know, difficult patients in the hospital. I would highlight that you'll notice similarly to the, uh, the CNS, the program does require two years of, of, of current hospital uh, acute care nursing experience. Okay, well, I believe I'm next. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Jim Gatewood. I am the specialty co-coordinator for the adult gerontology primary care nurse practitioner program, AGPCNP. I'm the third of the uh, adult gera programs. And um, in our program, um, AGPCNPs assess and manage um, the health care of adolescents, basically from 12 years old and up. We um, also see adults and older adults um, with a variety of acute and multiple chronic uh, conditions and a variety of primary care settings. And you'll find our graduates in uh, a, a number of different places throughout the Bay Area, including in community health clinics, um, larger health systems such as the, Vet the Veterans Administration, Stanford, UCSF, Sutter Health, um, and also um, in, uh, you know, a number of uh, companies working as, uh, you know, kind of occupational and environmental health uh, NPs, which I think someone else is, I think Su Jung's going to talk about that as well. Um, I'm a graduate of this program, and uh, many of the faculty you'll see here went to UCSF as well. And it's a real honor to be here uh, teaching the next generation of nurse practitioners. I, we love what we do, and we're really excited that you're interested uh, in our programs. Um, and we have a lot of interesting clinical sites for students and look forward to talking to you more about uh, this in the Q&A. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I am Dr. Elizabeth Gatewood, not related to Jim Gatewood, even though we work very closely together. Um, apparently, the program just, you know, entices Gatewoods to come. I am the current director of the FNP Specialty Coordinating Program, and I've been here for about 10 years, and I'm super happy that you're all here to join us. 
Um, I would say that our F&P program is really committed to providing and preparing graduates to work in underserved settings. So the majority of our clinical rotations and our graduates go on to work in federally qualified health centers with underrepresented and underserved populations. We love the entirety of the lifespan, and so we really are working and preparing you to work with that population. So OBGYN, pediatrics, adolescents, primary care, geriatrics, really the whole scope. And as you can imagine, that comes along with a unit load. So you really got to be excited about that whole load if you really want to go to this program. Um, one thing I will say is that we are not preparing you to work in acute care inpatient hospital settings. So if that is your interest, you should talk to Dr. Wayland and Dr. Gurton about the acute care program because we really are focused on outpatient clinicals. And that's where the majority of your rotations will be. Um, I have been an FNP for many, many years and have worked in a variety of settings. And one of the things I love about it is the flexibility. I've worked in LGBTQ, um, public health. I'm currently working at the Family Health Center at Zuckerberg San Francisco. San Francisco General, um, and the majority of our faculty are also still practicing and working in those settings. So we do often have you paired up with the faculty in your clinical rotations. Um, and I'm super happy that you're here and happy to answer any questions in the chat or afterwards. Thank you, Dr. Gatewood. Next. It should be Kate. Yes. Oh, there's the Hello, case. everyone. Hi, Dr. Holbrook. Hi, my name is Kate Holbrook. I'm, I'm one of the specialty coordinators for health policy and public health. Um, thank you all for being here tonight. Um, I'm also a UCSF graduate. Um, and in addition to teaching this program, I um, work in policy and infrastructure development for the California Department of Public Health, focusing on school-located vaccine delivery. And I also work with Bay Area um, regional health departments to provide disaster shelter training to public health nurses. So telling you that just to sort of understand what folks in this field might um, might be doing. Um, we're a very unique specialty in that we do not focus on sort of direct patient care, but rather on program systems and policies. We do straddle two departments. So the social and behavioral sciences and community health systems. So it just brings the richness of both of those departments and our faculty to the program. Many students that enter our specialty are nurses that either come from a community or public health background um, or may come from a clinical background, um, particularly actually from critical care. So our students have sort of seen issues on the ground and really want to work to change systems um, and policies to prevent disease and improve health, not just sort of one-on-one -on -one with individuals, but um, for entire populations. So we really focus on the structural determinants of health, upstream interventions, sort of the need to affect change at a community level, at a systems level, or an institutional level. Our students um, go to work in a lot of different settings, from healthcare institutions to government agencies, NGOs, advocacy organizations, health maintenance organizations, certainly lots of local health departments as well. They engage in policy research and development and implementation of um, programs, of monitoring evaluation of programs. They may work in administrative roles or education. For this specialty, clinical experience is not required, um, and there isn't an associated license or certification. So students in this specialty really have the flexibility to focus on a public health or policy issue that they are interested in, um, particularly when it comes to the practical experiences. We have very enthusiastic faculty who are excited to engage with you. So if you're still narrowing down your specialty selection, but like the idea of sort of upstream interventions or population level impact or making changes, perhaps in your current um, place of employment, we sure hope you will get in touch and I'll, I'll put my email in the um, in the chat. And then finally, I'll say I understand where you are right now. I'm actually wrapping up my DMP studies um, in public health nursing. And so for my project, I'm working with a local health department to improve access to preventive care for their clients. Um, and it's a teen family home visiting program. So just to give you an idea of what a project could look like in um, this type of specialty. Um, so certainly please reach out if you have any questions or are wondering what does it mean to be a nurse to do health policy or public health? We'd be happy to talk with you um, and talk more through it. And I think that's it for me. Okay. Uh... So my name is Su Jung Lee. Uh, I'm a faculty member in the Occupational Environmental Health Nursing Specialty Program. 
So our specialty coordinator, Dr. Wei Seng Hong. Uh, so and we have multiple um you know faculty in our specialty. So as you can see, the name of our program. So our program uh, is attached to the AGPCMP program. So the AGPCMP and occupational and environmental health nurse specialty. So this program is preparing clinical leaders and clinical experts in primary care, as well as occupational health services and occupational health uh, practices. Uh, so this is kind of a dual degree. So you will do all the AGPCMP program and you will have occupational and environmental health specialty coursework. Uh, because of this OEH additional coursework, our program is funded by the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health. So one um, you know, strong benefit is uh, students get partial uh, uh, the tuition support uh, for your training. So, so you can ask about, uh, about the funding uh, later. And also, uh, so this uh, occupation health, we are interested in worker population and injury uh, and illness prevention in the workplace, and then a program or a policy development for workplace health. So you will be developing clinical expertise in patient care or clinical care, and also uh, the work worker population uh, uh, in through this education. And also the our program is a uh, part of a uh, center for occupational environment health, and we uh, emphasize interdisciplinary training. So you will get training with occupational environment medicine, industrial hygiene, ergonomics, and uh, the uh, also toxicology. So you will get a uh, very very uh, interesting um, uh, content through our specialty. And uh, also, uh, after you completing our uh, program, uh, so our graduates work in diverse uh, settings. Uh, you know, various industries uh, you know, has some employment health services uh, in various companies. And also hospital has occupation health or employee health services. And also uh, occupation health providers or occupation health practices. So there are various settings uh, for the uh, the work opportunities. And uh, I think that's it. Um, so yeah, so uh, if you have any questions, yeah, please uh, contact us. Thank you. Hi everyone, thank you for being here tonight. My name is Brittany Christensen and I'm the Specialty Coordinator for the Acute Care Pediatric Nurse Practitioner Program. Um, so when you think about a pediatric nurse practitioner, that's kind of obvious, we take care of kids, right? But we have two different tracks. We have the primary care and the acute care. So with the acute care, um, our graduates, graduates um, work on the more critical side of illness. Um, so there is some overlap between our two specialties, but we really focus on the acute and critically ill patients that are experiencing episodic illnesses um, or an exacerbation of a chronic illness. We also focus on end of life care. So our key skills include um, doing diagnostic and therapeutic interventions, as well as monitoring and managing those critical illnesses and care coordination with uh, members of the health healthcare team. So we can do those things um, in inpatient and outpatient settings, primarily outpatient settings would be things like emergency departments or some of the specialty clinics and then inpatient settings could be anywhere from um, the various hospital units to intensive care units and then working with specialties that uh, work with the patients that are inpatient as well like and I'm saying patient a lot like neurosurgery is following their group and um, oncology and things of that nature um, transplant coordinators and things like that so our setting um, is ideal for nurses that want to deliver high intensity care to critically ill pediatric patients uh, we do require two years of pediatric acute care nursing experience to apply um, and I will put my email in the chat if you have any further questions so thank you again
Hi, everyone. I'm Bridget Gramkowski, and I'm here with my colleague, Marianne Israel, and we represent the Pediatric Primary Care Track. And I'm going to say thank you to Dr. Christensen for kind of clearly defining our two different tracks here. And I wanted to start with a little bit of fun trivia for you. Pediatric nurse practitioners were actually the first nurse practitioners in all of the United States. The role was created uh, in Colorado in the 1960s, and it, the goal was to improve children's access to high-quality pediatric care. And that goal continues today. So here at UCSF, the Pediatric Nurse Practitioner Primary Care Program prepares clinicians and leaders to promote health equity and optimal health from birth through young adulthood. So we work all the way from newborn to late adolescence in our program. And our students develop knowledge and skills to use in pediatric primary care, health, and chronic illness settings for children and adolescents in the community and in clinic environments. Um, most of our graduates go on to work in medically underserved communities, improving access to primary care for children throughout the state. Dr. Waxman mentioned that the DMP role of translating research into practice is part of what we do as DMPs, and evidence has shown that each visit to a primary care provider reduces long-term health care costs, and there's an abundance of public published literature that has found that spending on health care during childhood improves health into adulthood. These health benefits have been measured to continue to improve health outcomes for subsequent generations of families. So I invite you to come to our, uh, our breakout session and learn more about the Pediatric Nurse Practitioner Primary Care Program. 25% uh, of children in California are uh, living in poverty, and we are one of only four degree programs that are training California nurse practitioners in pediatrics. So we are so excited to welcome you to this field, and we look forward to talking to you more. Ah, this is me. My name is Mary Lynch, and I can tell you what I'm not, and I can tell you what I am. First off, I am not a psych mental health nurse practitioner. I am actually covering uh, for the faculty who had clinical commitments um, this evening. I will say that the Psych Mental Health Nurse Practitioner Program is one of our heavily subscribed programs. Why is that? Because the key responsibilities are to work with vulnerable and diverse populations. Um, the care that is given involves uh, complex biopsychosocial assessment, uh, clinical management, which can also include uh, medication therapeutics and psychotherapy. The practice settings are across the area of practice, um, and in many cases, individuals can be hired in inpatient practice settings and outpatient. Um, who should really consider this? I think if you feel like this area of working with vulnerable populations who are having behavioral uh, disorders, may have complex substance abuse disorders um, that are co-occurring um, co along with other um, chronic disease situations, that's really important. And the range of patient populations can be those who can really um, thrive with guidance and psychotherapy and support. And then there are others who are gonna need a greater level of uh, care. And again, the range of care that is given to individuals with psychiatric and behavioral disorders are covered in the program. The two key faculty for this program are Jane Abenez and, Kath, uh, and Kate Molino. Their um, uh, emails are listed here. Um, I think that's the only slide for this program, or is there another one, Mimi? That is the only slide. Okay. Thank you. So I, I would just really reinforce the fact that this is an excellent program, but it's also a program where um, the, the toll 
or the stress that can go along with it, it's something that you need to consider when making this life choice. Um, again, both of the faculty are going to be experts in guiding you in this program. Okay, now we're done. Thank you, Dr. Lynch. Back to Mimi. Thank you, Dr. Waxman. All right, next, I'm going to actually hand this over to my supervisor, Dr. Zavala. Can you take it off? Perfect. So thank you so much, Mimi. And like I mentioned at the beginning of this conversation, it's great to have you here. Uh, I'm going to talk briefly about uh, the cost of the program uh, and also some key steps that you need to take in order to be successful. And I'll briefly add later on, uh, well, not later on, like in about a minute or so, um, with regards to the support services that we offer to program, to all students. So number one is the cost of the program is approximately $41,000 a year, right? And that's for a three-year program. Um, that doesn't include health insurance. You can bring in your own health insurance if you wish, or you can um, get the health insurance from the university. Something that we're telling all applicants as soon as they get admitted into the program is to please complete your FAFSA, right? That is your financial aid application. Now, the important thing to remember about FAFSA is that it's not only loans, right? There are plenty of scholarship opportunities. There's plenty of funds available through the university that require students to complete a FAFSA first. Also within the School of Nursing, we also have a number of scholarship opportunities. So it's important for you to first complete that FAFSA so then we could try to figure out what else you qualify for. All right, now the other thing that is important here as well is that some UCSF employees receive a discount, right? now. If you want to know if you if you are a UCSF employee and you want to know if you qualify for that, you can contact us directly at nursingadmissions at UCSF.edu. We'll put that email. I think it's that email is coming up in a second. So you can contact us directly and we can try to answer that question for you. Also, with regards to support services, uh, the university and the school have gone out of their way to provide support services to our students. We want to make sure that you feel that the support that we provide to you is personalized, right? And it's just in time for you. So, for example, we offer veteran support services. We offer support for international students. We offer counseling. We offer wellness support. We're bringing on writing support services for the students in the School of Nursing. Um, in addition to that, we have housing, we have counseling, uh, we have health, uh, we have scholarships. I think altogether we offer 20, 20 different departments provide services to our students. So you will not be alone during your journey here. Uh, so any questions, I'll put my email um, in the chat in a second. Please feel free to reach out and we will get back to you and, and provide the support and the answers that you need. Mimi? Thank you, Joe. I know it's been an evening of continuous conversations and I really appreciate you all being up here with us this evening. But part of the conversation today that we want to highlight is one of our students from our first cohort from the BS Center DMP program. Please join me in welcoming Ali Siegel to talk more about her experience here as a student. Ali? Hey, everyone. Um... I'm Ali. I'm um, a DMP student and I started this past June. Um, I'm in the family nurse practitioner track and um, I'm here as living proof that there is life on the other side of this application process. Um, I know that this application can feel like such a big hurdle, but I wanted to share a little bit about my experience um, to give you some perspective from someone who's recently just went through it. Um, so I specifically wanted to talk about why I chose UCSF. Um, you know, when I was doing my research about different programs, there were so many programs out there that I could choose from. But what really stood out to me about UCSF was there was just so much emphasis on making a strong impact, like as a nurse leader in promoting health equity and, um, you know, working like in the inner workings of the healthcare system to uh, eliminate healthcare disparities. Um, 
I knew I personally really wanted to be part of a program that um, was had a community of faculty and peers that were going to help me reach this goal and um, serve a bigger purpose that aligned closely with my values. Um, so if you do choose that this program is right for you, um, I know that the application process can feel really overwhelming. I remember thinking, you know, there's the two essays, there's possibility that you have to take statistics again. There's all of the, um, the letters of rec you're going to have to get. Um, and I, I realized breaking down all of these tasks into smaller pieces just made it so much more manageable. Um, I think one of the most challenging parts for me was, was writing the essays. You know, it can be really tough to put your experiences and your perspectives and your goals into two short 500, um, 500 word essays. Um, but, you know, looking back on it, I, I realized that these essays really gave me the opportunity to look inward and reflect on why, like, why do I want to be here? Um, uh, like, you know, grad school is, is such a big commitment, both time-wise and money-wise. So it's it's really important that you dig deep and you understand your why. Um, for me, like writing those essays actually really helped me feel more confident about my decision in, you know, making this big step into uh, pursuing grad school. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is that, um, you know, there's a lot of roadblocks that came up during the application process. There's like lots of things that might come in, come in your way, like um, getting like getting letters of rec. If you've been out of school for more than five years, like reaching out to those old faculty members and, you know, feeling like you can't get in touch with anybody or I had this one professor who who had agreed that she was she was really excited for me when I um, told her I was going back to grad school. She seemed so eager to write me this essay or this letter of recommendation, and then came to uh, write the essay. Just total radio silence. Like I didn't hear anything back from her. So then I had to find a new person to write me a letter of rec. And so there's these tiny little roadblocks that come up, and they're just small hurdles you have to jump over to get to this amazing goal of becoming an, an advanced practice nurse. And um, I will say like the minute I stepped onto campus for prelude, um, which was when I got to meet all my classmates and my faculty, I felt like so relieved and just so happy that um, I was I was surrounded by peers that were so like minded and um, that were, were sharing a lot of the same goals as me, but also had different goals than me and we can all learn from each other. Um, so, yeah, I'm here to tell you that um, you can do this. Um, you have to take it day by day. Um, it's worth it. And it's really awesome for you to be even considering going back to school. And that's sometimes the hardest part. Um, yeah, I think Mimi linked my email here. Yes, um, I'm happy for you guys to reach out and ask me more about my personal experiences. Thank you so much, Ali. Thank you for joining us this evening. You've heard from Ali and you've heard from our specialty coordinators. You've heard from our program director. You've heard from our associate dean. It's time for you to start your application. We're ready to have you and we are so excited to begin this process. Before we go through the admission requirement, I'm actually going to hand it over to Joe really quickly to uh, give some feedback. Joe? Perfect. So, Ali, thank you so much for uh, for jumping in tonight and, and sharing your experience. I do remember having emails back and forth with Ali, right, and all the applicants last year. So, I will second what Ali said, apply early, right? Reach out to your potential letters of reference early, right? Um, reach out to us if you're unsure about what to submit, when to submit it, if the document is appropriate or not appropriate, we will walk you through the application process, right? That's what we're here to do. So. You know, if you ask for help, you will definitely get it, right? And it will be done in a timely fashion. So once again, Ali, thanks for, for reminding us. It's, you know, if you've been out of school for a while, it could seem daunting, mm -hmm. but that's why we're here, right? We're here to support you. Thanks, Mimi. Not a problem. Thank you so much, Joe. Again, thank you everyone for joining us. We're going to go through really quickly the re admissions requirements so we can focus on the Q&As. I see a lot of questions in the chat and I want to give some time to it. But it's basic, it's straightforward. You need a BSN to be able to apply. 
And that means while you're in the application phase, we only need your unofficial transcript for right now. You need to choose a specialty within the application, your RN licensure in California, goal statement, personal statements, those are very different. Again, we can talk through these steps and these requirements if you would like. Three to four letters of recommendation, your CV or resume, and a statistic course as well. So the application deadline, oh, Joe? Green, 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 green. What happened? I think you were on mute. Okay, sorry about that. No. Uh, the application deadline is on January 13th at midnight. Uh, so please make sure that you, you complete your application by then. I said letters of references are not easy to get at times. So plan ahead, right? Think about it. If you're unsure who to ask, ask us and we might tell you who else, you know, not personal so or disgusting. people, but they can definitely tell you uh, what roles uh, can provide a letter of reference for you. Um, the statistics course, Mimi went over, uh, goal statements are key, personal statements, like Ali said, those are key. Uh, you do need your nursing license before the program starts in mid-June, right? Yes. So if you're planning on graduating, for example, in the winter or the spring, you can apply for a temporary license, right? Those tend to come faster. You just need to show us proof that you have applied for that temporary license so that we could put that into the application packet uh, once we review it. But you will need your nursing license before um, classes start. Thank you, Joe. And to piggyback on what Joe spoke about, we are here to help you through the process. So scan that QR code and let's meet one-on-one -on -one to talk through the application process help you get started if you're feeling stuck. This might feel new and you might need to have a conversation with us about the difference between a goal statement and a personal statement. So we do have personalized one-on-one -on -one sessions for you. All right, we're gonna go into question and answer session soon, but before we do, I wanna say a big thank you for joining us. And if you enjoyed this little segment, we want to share this opportunity with any other persons, friends or colleagues that you believe should know more about our program. It's a new program, so we're doing the best that we can to broadcast on and reach out to anyone who might be thinking about getting a DMP. So once you scan that QR code, it actually takes you to a place where you can suggest some conferences, events, or you can invite us to a career fair at your hospital to talk more to your colleagues, friends who might be interested in our program. All right, I'm going to stop share now so that we can focus on some questions we already have in the chat. And if you do not have questions in the chat and you feel confident to come on camera, please do so now. Um, and while we're waiting for questions, I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Lynch to give us some nice words as she always does. Thank you so much. Uh, really quick, you know, questions that have come up, are there going to be, are we going to be oversaturated by NPs nationally and locally? That is not the case, either in peds or adult. And particularly um, our, our specialties, our students who graduate from our specialties have a high likelihood of being um, employed within a year. Now, some of them do choose to go to Southern California. They may choose to go to Central Valley. Um, they may choose to go out of state. But there, there are multiple employment opportunities uh, for NPs in, in the immediate Bay Area. So the concern there is, is it. But you know what? It can. I, I think I want to leave with one piece. It can feel amazingly daunting to think that you're applying to a doctoral program. That imposter syndrome can come up and you can say, I'm not smart enough. I don't know enough. Why? Why? What would I do with the doctor? Can I really do this? And the answer is, yes, you can do this work. Yes, you can bring your knowledge from the bedside to the educational environment. And yes, you can be admitted. So rather than say all the reasons why you shouldn't apply, apply. 
And, and again, we're here to be able to answer any questions we can. And I'm going to turn it over to Lisa because it looks like she has her hand up. I just wanted to piggyback on something you said, Dr. Lynch. I was just at a conference two weeks ago where um, they were presenting some of their staffing challenges and his solution to the challenge was we just hired a bunch of NPs. And so um, it's being talked about in conferences. And yes, you know, I, I think we've all experienced in our nursing career ebbs and flows of, um, you know, hiring freezes and on and off. But um, but this is a profession that is here to stay. And um, and we are a force in the healthcare system. Thank you. Right, Jimmy, I think we're ready for questions. Yeah. If you have a question, please raise your hand or unmute your mic at this time. Go ahead, Shimena. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I just had a question. I, I asked this in the chat, but then I heard at the end maybe like a different um, answer. So I I just wanted to I come on here and get some information. I do graduate in May, so I'm not graduating this semester, but I just wanted to ask, so um, as far as applications go, we're able to apply even if we haven't graduated yet and graduate before the start of the program and get our RN license before the start of the program? Correct. Okay, and then you were just saying that we would have to, um, before we graduate, we'd have to already request to get a temporary license so it can come sooner, right? Yeah, um, one, one caveat. Some of the specialties require um two years experience mm -hmm. right so um we have to make sure others don't so for the ones that don't obviously yeah you could you could graduate in may and you could submit your application before january 13th mm -hmm. you just make a note during your application or contact us and we'll annotate that in in your application oh. and then um I wanted to do the um, midwifery program, but I did see the response that it's not currently offered right now, but hopefully by December. So for that one, it would be entry level, correct? That's correct. Okay, good. Okay, thank you. Stephanie, go ahead. Hi, thank you. Um, I really appreciate how encouraging you guys have all have been about applying to the program. However, I am probably a more non-traditional student. Um, uh, nursing was a second career for me. I just got through it and I wasn't too concerned about grades. I don't know what my GPA was. Um, so I don't consider myself a very strong applicant other than my experience. Um, and so I was wondering if you could maybe give me, I, I, applying to UCSF just seemed insane to me until, um, a friend of mine encouraged me to look into it because um, she also wants to apply. Um, so I was wondering if you could give me an idea of, I guess, what the likelihood is of, you, you mentioned that um, that you take a holistic approach to um, your applicants. Sort of what is, is it possible for someone with maybe not the best GPA, I truly don't know what my GPA is, um, to even get into this program does how much does experience count? How much does an interview count or personal statement? All that kind of stuff. Thank you. Um, I could start with that and perhaps Mary, you could add to it as well. Uh, so we take a holistic approach to reviewing applications, right? We're, we're looking at the whole applicant. We're just not looking at GPA, right? So uh, the minimum GPA is at 3.0, uh, but your experience your personal statement, your goal statement, your commitment to the field, uh, your passion for the field, right? What you're planning on doing afterwards and you will include that information in your goal statement. All of those things count, right? So I, I and I say this to all applicants, you know, to prospective applicants attending tonight, please don't be discouraged, right? We're here to support you. We take a holistic approach to this, have a diverse student population, right? That's how we thrive as an institution. So I would just say that the minimum GPA for the bulk of our programs is 3.0. However, if your GPA, you should look it up, is not, it's lower than 3.0, then you have to think about how you're going to explain why your GPA was lower. 
Maybe it was a degree of maturation that you didn't have then that you have now. Maybe there were issues such as requirements to work. So if you can explain to us the reasons that potentially contributed to a GPA lower than 3.0, that's going to make your file competitive. However, I also want to say that if if it's substantially lower and, and if it's something like 2.0, then we would really need to be able to talk with you about options to improve your overall package um, to be actually seen as a potential applicant. So first step, go find out what that GPA is. If it's on the lower end of the twos, contact Joe, Mimi, KT, or myself, and, and we'll have a better discussion with you than something real quick right now. Okay. And, yeah. and Jim, Stephanie, I, I just, oh, sorry, I just wanted to say one thing. Um, you know, I mean, to look at me, you'd think I was a nurse practitioner for the last 30 years, but the, the truth is I was also a second career uh, nurse practitioner. I came in actually graduated from the program in 2019. Um, you know, some of the people on this uh, video here today taught me uh, as a student. And so it was an incredibly welcoming environment. Um, UCSF does a lot to support non-traditional students. So I would encourage anybody um, who is thinking about doing this, it, maybe you, if you have any concerns about that, feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to talk about that, but it's a very welcoming place for non-traditional students. Thank you, Jim. Bridget, I see you nodding. Did you want to add something? Well, I was just going to say that I also was a second career uh, student and many of us are, and um, we celebrate that because you bring wisdom from all other, all of your other experiences in life. Thank you so much, Jim and Bridget. I appreciate it. Stephanie, I hope that answers your question. And I hope that answers the question to anyone else who has that same question as well. Um, Stephanie, I would love to do a one-on-one -on -one with you sometime next week, uh, just to talk through what this would look like if you're interested. Uh, it would help get the process started. All right, any other questions? Um, we are already at 7.02 and I know we were supposed to end at seven. So, um, actually, I'm going to ask this one question from Stevie in the chat, Mary. If applying now for summer, would midwifery be an option if this approved in December for that court? Yes, our plan is pending approval from the National Accreditation Body, um, which again, I believe we're going to know by December, January at the very latest, then we would put out with an with on our website that we are opening applications for the cohort that would start in summer of 2025. So yes, our plan is if we're approved, we're moving forward immediately on applications. We'll just have to tweak the time frame for our deadline for that cohort of applicants. Thank you, Dr. Lynch. All right, I wanna say a big thank you to our specialty faculty members for being here this evening. Thank you so much. If you haven't felt the love this evening, I don't know what you were doing. <laughs> CSF is an amazing school and we cannot wait to welcome you next year by the summer to our program. Start an application today and reach out if you have any questions. Thank you everyone, have a good night. Thank you, thank you all. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.